Hey everyone, this is Pete, and welcome back to Atari A to Z, a series of short playthroughs of Atari 8-bit games, some which I grew up with and some which are new to me. Today is one of the former. Today we're taking a look at Livewire, which was a 1983 release from Analog, developed by Tom Hudson, as so many games from Analog were. Now, as with most of Analog's games, this was a type-in machine code listing. And Hudson's actually written a bit about this game online on his own website. If I remember to put it in the description, I'll put a link down there. Now, Hudson recalls that the game came about initially because he and Analog's publisher, Lee Pappas, really enjoyed Atari's Tempest arcade machine. In fact, the pair of them enjoyed it so much that Hudson actually bought a Tempest arcade machine to put in the Analog offices and keep it on free play all the time so they could play it whenever they wanted. Now, apparently, at the 1983 West Coast Computer Fair in San Francisco, Hudson recalls talking to Atari fans who read Analog and asking them what they wanted to see in future issues of Analog, what they wanted to see from type-in listings, what games they wanted, and that sort of thing. Uh, Hudson's desire to do an Atari 8-bit version of Tempest was very strong. Uh, he thought he could do it well, and the idea was very well received by his readers as well. Now, one reader had actually gone over to Analog's rival, Antic, and uh, told them about Hudson's desire to do a version of Tempest. And they'd essentially said that it would be impossible to do on an Atari. And Hudson recalls, he said, nobody tells me something I want to do is impossible. I'd show those antic bums. And so he did, and the result was Livewire. So let's go play Livewire. Okay, here we are with Livewire by Tom Hudson for Analog Computing, one of many type-in machine code listings for Analog. And for a lot of people, I think this is one of the best ones. This is certainly one I remember playing from back in the day um, and having a lot of fun with. Even though I, I actually became aware of this game before I was aware of Tempest. Um, so, yeah. I actually sort of almost ended up liking this more than Tempest. Mind you, the first version of Tempest I played was the Atari ST version, which was okay, but not amazing. This, on the other hand, really slick, really responsive. Very good implementation of the basic formula. Okay, it's not as smooth as the vector graphics of the original. But it does what it needs to, and the important thing is that the controls, the controls in this game are excellent. They're super responsive, very quick. Lots of bullets on screen at once. And a real sense that you're always in control of what's going on. Whoops. Oh yeah, I, I just think it's a, it's a really impressive technical achievement. And a good game in its own right. I mean, yes, it's very simple, but I mean, Tempest... That's no good, is it? <laughs> but I mean, Tempest at heart wasn't a particularly complicated game either. It just looked cool because of its presentation. Oh dear. Oh dear me. But yeah, this has most of the features that Tempest has. I mean, it even has the Super Zapper. If you press the space bar on a level, I think you can do that once per level, maybe. It just destroys everything that's on the screen. And so yeah, the, the only thing that's sort of missing from this game compared to the original Tempest, is the this sort of smooth 3D movement as you go down the tunnel at the end of the stage. So that means that this game doesn't have um, the sort of spike dodging aspect of Tempest. Which is a bit of a shame, but not the end of the world by any means. I really like the feeling that you, you can sort of sweep back and forth in this game and send out a shower of bullets and then sort of 
you can move on before your bullets hit its target. So that means you can launch an assault at something that is shooting at you. But be able to get out of the way before it reaches you. And as you can hopefully see, we've got a nice variety of different enemies going on. Oops. All of whom behave a little bit differently from one another. So we've got these blue sort of double things coming up the tunnel at the minute, which uh, sort of appear and disappear as they come up the lanes. Got these little sphere things that weave back and forth. You got the turquoisey squares that just come up the uh, the passageways. Oops. Oh. Hmm. Maybe you're not supposed to shoot those. How strange. Anyway, let's have another go because this is good, good, a good game. I'm enjoying myself. So, I mean, we've seen a number of analogue games on this series up until this point. And it's hopefully already very clear why they were so well regarded. Because in many cases, these games are sort of commercial quality games for the period. But you could have them for free because they were typing listings from a magazine. And that was something that really helped to distinguish Analog from a lot of its competitors at the time. I mean, Antic Magazine did a lot of typing listings. Um, and it did a mixture of machine code and basic listings but quite early on analog decided to focus almost exclusively on these machine code games which some other publications decided to try not to do because um there is the feeling that typing listings are an important way for people to learn how to program and so particularly with basic listings, you could type in the program and you could sort of observe what it was doing. Oh, I see, they reflect your bullets. Yeah, you could type in a basic listing and you could get a really good feel for what it was doing while you were typing it in. And you could actually learn quite a lot from doing that. Whereas if you were typing in a machine code listing, which tended to be a bunch of data statements... Um, you weren't learning a lot directly. And so what an and so what analog often did to try and counter that is that alongside the machine code listing uh, sorry the basic listing that had all the uh, machine code data statements for you to create the executable file, um, they would also post the assembler listing as well. And so that meant that those who did want to learn how to program, who did want to learn something from these games, they could look at the source code and they could fiddle around with it in one of the many assemblers that were available for the Atari 8-bit. And people like Tom Hudson would often take the opportunity to include a bit of information about how they achieved various things in the articles that went alongside these program listings. So it wasn't just a case of the program was listed in the magazine, you typed it in and that was it. There was often a, an article to go alongside it. And that would often talk about any number of things, really. Um, usually it would, tell, it would tell readers at least a little bit about how the program was put together and how it came about. But it would often delve into things like game design as well. So people like Tom Hudson would talk about how they put this game together, um, what they felt worked about it, what could maybe improve about it, and all that sort of thing as well. So
in that sense, those who are feeling particularly adventurous can actually take on the challenge of exploring these programs in more detail, modifying them for their own ends, and making their own variations. Now that's quite a bit harder to do with a machine code listing than it is with uh, a basic listing, but it's still possible. It's still possible. Once you've got a, a sort of basic understanding of how the program is doing what it does, you could then experiment and tweak things and see what happened. And the beauty of programming stuff on the Atari 8-bit for the most part was that you couldn't really break your machine doing it. Because if you did do something that locked the machine up, all you needed to do was turn it off and back on again. You know, as, as the old joke goes, just turn it off and on again. And that was literally true in the case of the Atari 8. But if something went wrong, you're like, oh no. Switch it off, give it a minute, turn it back on again. <laughs> This is also where a lot of people learn to save their work before trying anything weird. So, for example, if you're programming something in BASIC and you weren't sure if, uh, say, a certain poke you'd put in was going to work or if a machine code routine you'd incorporated into your BASIC program wasn't going to work properly, then you'd make damn sure that you'd saved your program before you ran it. And I suspect the same was true for programming an assembly language as well. That's not a side of things I've ever actually explored myself because I, I always found assembly language a little bit difficult to understand because it's... I like to program in... Well, on the few occasions I have programmed, which is not all that often. I like to sort of focus on the creative angle of things. So, like, I can... I can think about programming in terms of... Right, this is what I want. This is what I want to happen on the screen. This is what I want this program to do. But I sometimes have a bit of trouble relating that creative angle to the actual technical side of things. So, I mean, I've noticed this even when putting games together using pieces of software that don't require much in the way of programming. So, for example, if we look at um, things like Click and Play in Games Factory for PC, which were successors to um, STOS on the Atari ST, those didn't require any programming whatsoever, but I still struggled a little bit with the sort of logic side of things. So, for example... On several occasions, I've sort of thought, oh, this is a really good idea for a puzzle game. And so I could, I could sort of describe to you what I want, how I wanted the game mechanics to work, but I wouldn't be able to tell you how to actually execute those game mechanics using the tools I had available to me. And eventually I, I got quite good at finding creative solutions to problems like that. So, for example, at one point I remember being very proud of the fact that I found a way around the limitations of um, click and plays, lack of variables, lack of global variables. Um, and the way I did that was by having a hidden non-moving player four sprite on the screen. And that meant you had access to the player one, two, three and four lives and score to use as global variables. Now, subsequent releases of Click and Play and Games Factory and Multimedia Fusion, as it eventually became, did actually add proper global variables. But that's an example of the sort of creative solution that I would find. Not necessarily the most efficient, but it, it I mean, it worked. <laughs> I 
And I guess to a certain extent, programming stuff in basic and assembly language is all about learning those sort of bodge jobs for yourself. There's probably a right way to do most things, but... Ultimately, as long as the thing you want to happen happens on the screen at the right time and doesn't freeze up the program, then you've been successful. I feel like that's, that's probably a big appeal element for old school programming for a lot of people because... I feel like programming in today's engines, like Unity and, and whatnot, you have to be very conscious of all sorts of things that I feel like people didn't have to worry about in the past. I mean, may maybe they did. Like I say, I, I, I never sort of programmed on the, the more professional end of things. But like, when I was fiddling around with programming on the Atari ABA, I never heard anyone use the term memory leak, for example, and I still don't really know what that is. <laughs> I mean, yes, you still had to bear certain things to do with memory in mind when you were programming for these things, because you had much less of it than you do on today's systems, so... Um, I think I read on Tom Hudson's website that they tried to make the vast majority of analogues typing listings work on a 32k machine. Which was sort of a, sort of a, a very common amount of memory for an Atari owner to have. So the, the earliest Atari machines had I think 4 or 8k of memory. Um, but they were both expandable. And a lot of people went up to about 48k or so, but 32k struck a nice balance. Because that upgrade was within the budget of a lot of people. And eventually 48k became the standard, and then 64k... One thing that never really happened was 128k for the 130xe becoming a sort of required standard. I mean, there were there certainly were some games out there that would take advantage of the extra memory if it was available. So they use things like a RAM disk. So they they load stuff into RAM to sort of reduce the amount of um, loading that the game would have to do from disk. Oops. But I'm not actually aware of any anything that really required 128k. Outside of stuff that's been made more recently, of course. There is plenty of more recent stuff that's been released and which has been specifically designed for 130xe, but back in the day when it was current, that was a lot less common because a load of people still had the 64k 800xo in particular. That was that was I believe the most popular variant of the Atari 8-bit. And so a lot of developers didn't really want to go beyond that 64k mark. Because it risked alienating part of their audience. And to be honest, the Atari audience was already struggling so much at the time anyway from losing out to the Spectrum and the Commodore 64 and simply the fact that the mainstream magazines of the time just liked to ignore Atari altogether. And you can see it, if you look back at old episodes of Page 6, for example, Page 6 New Atari User, which was one of the two main Atari magazines in this country, nearly every month Editor Les Ellingham, in his editorial column, is complaining about people not supporting the Atari enough. Um, and it's understandable. It's frustrating, because these, these were great machines with great, unique capabilities, and they would just get ignored. And, yeah, 
it felt like they got much better support in america from publications like analog and antic and so on but i mean yeah ultimately they they, they still struggled a bit but uh there you have it. Anyway, that is Live Wire by Tom Hudson for Analog Magazine. Uh, as we say, one of many typing machine code listings for the Atari 8-bit platform published in that magazine. And one of the best for a lot of people. And it's certainly a very good game. Anyway, we'll leave that there for today. As always, thank you very much for watching. And I'll see you again next time. <laughs>